Welcome to Loudon Soccer's Saturday Session and Game Day Series, a collection of videos to help our head coaches and assistant coaches better understand the format and their responsibilities each Saturday during the season. Loudon Soccer's mission is to create soccer players, coaches, and teams of strong character committed to achievement on the field and in our community. Our philosophy is to develop champions for life. Loudoun Soccer is governed by its five core values, fun, integrity, fairness, teamwork, and stewardship. We love sports and all the benefits that they provide. Those Saturday game days and sessions can bring out the best of us, but they can also bring out the worst. It's really important that we as adult leaders, head coaches and assistant coaches set a positive example for others to follow. Remember, it is for the kids. Please live our values and rep the red. The following presentation refers to our formats for the Saturday sessions and game days for all of our age groups. Coaches are expected to visit our Safe Return to Play page at loudonsoccer.com specifically to review the game day protocols and modifications to ensure that all of our members stay safe and stay healthy during this time. Game schedules are available within your team page. Log into your user account to see them. We encourage all of our members to double check those details on a regular basis. Sometimes there may be a change. With advance notice, a location or time change will be communicated via email. But on the day of, if fields close, you may be alerted uh, via email or text. There's also such a thing as a game time decision, meaning we show up at the field scheduled to play, but if conditions worsen at that location, the person in charge, whether it's a lead trainer or a referee or the absence of both the head coaches, will make a decision on the spot whether to play. In terms of game reschedules, we already deconflict head coaches of multiple teams. So if you're coaching two or more teams, we will take care of conflicts for you. But in the event we miss something, please notify us immediately so we can correct it. If there is a reschedule due to a weather or field related issue, that reschedule will be generated by the program manager and communicated to you. But for all other reschedules, it is very difficult for us to accommodate. But if you do have a conflict, we will do everything we can for you. Here's what we ask of you. First, check with your assistant coach if you have one to see if he or she is available to cover. Try to play the game as scheduled. But if you don't have an assistant coach or he or she is not available to cover, notify your program manager as soon as possible. Your program manager will work with you and the other team's coach on a reschedule and will get that fixed as soon as possible. Coaches should not reschedule on your own because you will not have a referee if your age group allows it. It's important that we reschedule the game for you so we can notify the referee assigner and he or she can do their best to assign a referee to be at your rescheduled match. Soccer is an outdoor sport. We try to play as often as we can, but sometimes weather and fields do not cooperate. So as a rule of thumb, check your email or text alerts for any field closure updates each Saturday you're scheduled. Decisions are made by Loudoun County Parks and Rec each Saturday morning as to whether or not the fields are open. And those fields may close after heavy rain or water saturation. If those fields are closed, absolutely no training or game takes place. If the fields are open, game on. We just hope the weather cooperates. So if we see lightning or hear thunder, it is a 30 minute delay. Get everyone under cover. Please make sure you know where all your players are. We play in rain as long as the fields are open. So coaches do not cancel Saturday games or sessions. A game time decision may occur on the field, whether it's by the lead trainer or the referee, or the head coaches in the absence of a lead trainer or referee. But unless you hear otherwise from the club, game on. 
each individual family is responsible for outfitting their child with the following items. A quick note about shin guards, they should be fully covered by long socks. Make sure that the socks go over the shin guards. Also a quick note, make sure to remind families to bring plenty of water, especially on those hot days. A few special notes about equipment. In terms of shoes or cleats, soccer cleats and turf shoes are permitted. Regular athletic shoes, gym shoes are permitted. But baseball or football cleats, due to having a front toe stud, are not permitted. Referees are instructed not to allow a child to participate if a front toe stud exists. So make sure your families are aware of this requirement. Another one. No jewelry is permitted. This can be a big deal for girls who often have their ears pierced. Those earrings need to come out because they're a safety hazard for that child and for others. Covering them with bandages or tape is not permitted. Lastly, a child may participate with a hard cast as long as it is padded and fully covered. If your game has a referee, the referee will determine based on their best judgment, whether that cast is properly padded and covered and safe for other participants. Coaches should bring their own equipment, especially that first aid kit and ice pack in case there are injuries on the field. It's also a good idea as coaches accumulate more equipment to perhaps pack extra shin guards or extra jerseys in case a child shows up and forgets one of their required items. A few quick pre-game notes regarding our high school 7v7 league. All players will be issued a numbered jersey of the same color. Coaches will also be issued scrimmage vests, one for each player on their team. If your team is considered the home team, you will wear scrimmage vests that day. The visiting team or away team will wear their jerseys. Make sure you bring your vests with you in case you need to wear them that day. Teams should arrive about 30 minutes before kickoff. We try to schedule games to allow an appropriate amount of time for warmups, but if the previous game is still going on or those teams have not yet left the field, please wait outside the fenced area and let those teams exit before you enter the field. When you get your bench area set up, please introduce yourself to the opposing team's coach and introduce yourself to the referees. You guys will be working together that day. Confirm any variations to the playing format, but most importantly, set a positive tone for your players as they watch you, the opposing coach, and the referees work together. To keep these games managed, it's important that everyone knows where they are allowed to sit and whether or not. Teams are going to occupy one touchline on opposite halves. Spectators will be on the opposite touchline across from their team. Coaches should remain in the technical area. That's the space between the midfield line and the top of the penalty area. Everyone, whether it's a coach or player or spectator, needs to be at least 10 feet from the touchline. That's three big steps away. No one is permitted within the penalty area or behind the goals, unless some modifications to allow physical distancing requires it. But if anyone is in that area, no coaching, instructing, directing, cheering, or distracting is permitted in that area of the field. Only players on your official team roster may participate in these sessions or games. It is imperative do not permit unregistered players to play. It is a serious liability issue. Similarly, only approved coaches may coach the players on these days, whether it's warming up the team or sitting on the team sideline of the field. An approved coach is someone who's registered, has completed a background check, they appear on your team page, and they've completed safe sport training. If they haven't accomplished these tasks, do not let them 
interact with your team as a coach. International soccer is governed by FIFA. FIFA creates its laws of the game, which are the rules that the highest level of soccer plays under. Revisions to those rules are implemented every year on June 1st. Youth soccer will further modify these laws of the game to fit the age and ability of those athletes. Loudoun Soccer creates and provides abridged rules to help coaches better understand these modifications. If you pick up your equipment, you will have one in the folder, but you can also find one digitally in our Coaches Info Center. Our high school 7v7 division plays 7 versus 7. Six field players and a goalkeeper. Games are 60 minutes long, two 30-minute halves with a five-minute halftime break. For this fall 2020 season, we are foregoing pre-game captain's coin tosses and instead having the home team choose which side to defend to start the game with the visiting or away team kicking off. Teams will switch ends at halftime and the other team will kick off. Substitutions are made during specific stoppages for games that are played with halves. Those stoppages include your team's throw-in, an opposing team's throw-in if they too are subbing, either team's goal kick or kickoff, a one-for-one -one situation if there was an injury or discipline situation. For example, if you have a player who's injured and subs out, the other team might be permitted to allow one player to be subbed, or if the other team has a player that's getting yellow carded, you may be able to sub a player too at that stoppage and then free substitution may take place at halftime. A few notes about the substitution procedure. It is at the referee's discretion, meaning the referee must wave the players on the field before they enter. So you may get the referee's attention by yelling sub, but that doesn't mean those players may enter or exit the field. Typically, substitutions occur at the midfield line but those rules may be relaxed to allow substitution to take place from the general bench area. Sort that out with your referee prior to kickoff. Players in our high school 7v7 league are still part of our recreational pro program. As such, they should receive 50% playing time each week. There's a provision involved there which is a child should attend at least one of the two team practices in order to receive that 50% playing time. You as a coach can take playing time away if a child misses both practices. But before you do that, please check with the child and maybe even check with their parents to understand why they missed practice that week. Avoid punishing them for situations outside of their control. It might be really important for them to play soccer on Saturdays. So again, check with the family to better understand the circumstances before you reduce their playing time. The goalkeeper position does not need to be rotated for high school 7v7. We encourage it, but it's not required. And if you do rotate goalkeepers, we encourage that those players receive playing time on the field as well. In the event one team cannot field a full starting lineup, then the play balance rule should be adhered to. When that situation arises, our preferred method is that the team that is short players borrows a player or two from the other team so that the preferred format of 4v4 or 7 versus 7, etc. can take place as scheduled. We also encourage that borrowed player to be rotated so no child feels like they're being shortchanged or feels conflicted about playing their friends and teammates. This allows more players to play, so coaches should work together to coordinate. But if for some reason the team that's short prefers not to borrow a player or two, then those teams can play down for even numbers. Assuming, of course, that the team that has more players does not violate the minimum playing time standards. 
This is unlikely to occur for first and second grade games due to the roster size and the game format, but coaches should work together prior to kickoff in the event one of their teams cannot field a full lineup. Coaches should rotate players into multiple positions. This can be done throughout the game, but if it's not done through the game, it should definitely be done throughout the season. Give those players opportunities to play different positions throughout the season. Do not pigeonhole a player at a young age to a specific position. It will only hurt their development and their joy for the game. Most of the restarts we see in full-sided 11v11 play are also utilized in our high school 7v7. This includes throw-ins, direct and indirect free kicks, and goal kicks and corner kicks and kickoffs. Note that on restart kicks, direct and indirect, the defending player must be at least eight yards away. Also note that the goalkeeper is not permitted to punt or drop kick the ball. He or she may roll it, throw it, or kick it. They can release it to their feet and dribble it, but they are not allowed to punt or drop kick it. If they do punt or drop kick, the restart is an indirect free kick for the opposing team at the spot of the infraction. The offside law is in effect for high school 7v7 with the following modification. Instead of it occurring in the attacking half of the field, it will be applied in the attacking third of the field. Most of the fields at London Soccer Park will have a painted blue line that can be used as that build out or offside line. But if it's not available, you can place cones equal distant between the penalty area and the midfield line to identify where offside is applied. Make sure those cones are off the field, but visible so players can see it. Recognize that the offside law has a lot of moving parts. It's not just the player who's behind the second to last opponent and involved in the play. There's a lot more to it, but that's the gist of it. Players will have a hard time recognizing it during the game, even at the high school level, and referees will have a hard time recognizing it within the flow of the game. So give them some leeway and some compassion if they happen to miss an offside call. Some teams may be stronger or more competitive than others. Might be throughout the season, could be just that day. But when we encounter that sort of imbalance, we have the competitive balance rule, which states that when one team is losing by four goals, they may add an extra player to the field. They don't have to, but it's encouraged. Once that deficit is reduced to three, that specific extra player should be removed. Additionally, if your team is leading by a large amount, coaches are expected to adjust their style to avoid running up the score. A few suggestions. Rotate positions. Maybe you play some of those underdeveloped players more in attacking positions and give them an opportunity to score. You might play those less developed players more or depending on the age, you might even consider adding a condition to the game, such as your team needs to connect five consecutive passes before they try to score. Ultimately, these steps are in place to avoid blowouts from occurring. Please note that some of the modifications in regards to safety at the younger age groups have been lifted for our high school 7v7 league. Specifically, slide tackling is permitted, although it is discouraged. Please continue to emphasize that your players should stay on their feet, and there is no restriction when it comes to heading the ball. Head injuries are serious, and they can occur in a couple different ways in the game of soccer, whether it's a ball hitting the head, or two heads colliding, or a player falling and hitting their head on the ground, among others. If you suspect a child has sustained a concussion, remove them from the field immediately. Check for symptoms. That player is barred from returning that day if you think they've sustained a concussion. Our rule of thumb is when in doubt, set them out. Make sure their family is aware of the symptoms that you've recognized and make sure that they know they need to go see a doctor before returning. You as a coach after the game should notify the club 
of the player who may have sustained a concussion. And then it's up to that family to go provide a return to play document from their medical provider before rejoining the next practice or game. We have uh, ad additional information on concussions and our protocols in our coaches information center. It's a good habit to go check that out prior to each season so you're well versed on what to look for and how to handle them. Soccer is a physical sport, which means injuries can occur. It's important that coaches bring their first aid kit and their ice packs so they can treat minor injuries. If we encounter any severe or major injuries, call 911 or send that child to the hospital with their parents. If a player suffers an injury while on the field, the referee must stop the play before you can enter the field to check on them. You may need to get the referee's attention if they don't see the player has been injured. It's also important that you as the coach receive permission to enter the field from the referee before you do so. Failure to do so may result in you as a coach receiving a yellow card. An injured player does not need to be subbed, but as a rule of thumb, if the play stops for their health, they should probably exit the field. Depending on the severity of the injury or the age of the player, you as a coach might enlist the help of their parent to care for the child so that you can focus on the rest of the players. A match may be suspended, meaning delayed, or abandoned, meaning canceled, due to inclement weather or field conditions. This is what we referred to earlier as a game time decision. If we see lightning or hear thunder, it's an automatic 30 minute delay. That clock resets with each subsequent sign. Everyone should be waiting in their cars when that occurs. The referee ultimately determines if a game is suspended or abandoned. We have to be mindful of the matches taking place immediately afterward, and it's not fair to impact their kickoff time if our match is suspended. If your match is suspended or abandoned, please notify your program manager after the game so that we can determine when or if it should be rescheduled. Let's talk about referees. First and foremost, they are independent of Loudoun Soccer. They're certified through U.S. Soccer, and they're free to work any soccer matches nationwide. Unfortunately, there's a severe shortage of referees, both in terms of the quantity and quality not just in Loudoun County or in Virginia, but nationwide. Most of our referees are young and inexperienced. They are also learning just like players, which means they're gonna make mistakes. One of the referee's primary jobs is to interpret the laws of the game. Those interpretations are going to vary. They'll change from referee to referee and from game to game. What one referee might consider a handball, another referee may not. The hope for us as coaches is that that referee's interpretations that day will be consistent throughout that match. That consistency is going to be hard to come by. Referees are human. Mistakes are going to be made. And if you watch any type of sport at the highest level, you will recognize that officiating errors occur. So if we see them happening on Super Bowl Sunday or the Champions League final, we should expect them to happen Saturday morning at the local elementary or middle school. Set your expectations accordingly. The referee is considered the boss of the game. They're in charge, even if they're a pimply-faced, voice-cracking teenager who barely blows the whistle. Dissent is considered any questioning of the referee's authority which can also result in the coach or a player being ejected from the match. Please don't focus on the referees. They're out of your control, much like the weather. Focus on your players instead. There is zero tolerance toward referee abuse or referee assault. Either will be dealt with swiftly and severely. If you as a coach have a serious concern about an official or would like to provide some feedback, positive or constructive, email our referee development coordinator with the specific details and let our referee leadership help these officials improve. 
referees are assigned to matches by certified referee assigners. If we know in advance that your game does not have a referee assigned to you, we'll notify you the day of so you can plan accordingly. The match should still be played. Sometimes assigned referees don't show. There might be a last minute conflict. Sometimes life happens. If a referee does not show, please play the game. The coaches might alternate quarters or halves refereeing the match, or perhaps you can find a parent or an older sibling to officiate instead. If a referee does not show, please notify us so we can find out why that referee no-showed and hold them accountable. We as coaches need to model appropriate behavior. It's important that we serve as that positive role model for our players, our parents, and our fellow coaches. Recognize that you as a coach are responsible for your team and fan conduct. So if you witness inappropriate behavior, please correct it. At the same time, you are not responsible for the behavior of others outside of your team. So please avoid confrontations with knuckleheads. It is not your responsibility to defuse it. So please keep cool, walk away, and report them to us. Be the bigger person. Remember, it's for the kids and it should be fun. Following each match, make sure you organize a good game gesture from your team to the opponents. Note that no handshake line or handshakes on the field should occur. Please be also sure to recognize and thank the referees, both from you and your players. Please quickly clean and clear your bench area so the next teams can start and please exit the area. Again, we need to clear the field so the next teams can start. Be sure to send game details, specifically the date, time, location, and scores to Karen Corp so she can record and publish the scores. This should be done by both teams, whether you win or lose or draw. It's important that we have a timely score collection because that will impact our end of season playoffs. If you encounter any sort of serious issues pertaining to your team, the opposing team, coaches, spectators, referees, field issues, notify our program manager as soon as possible so we can try to solve that problem as quickly as possible. For additional resources, please visit our Coaches Info Center. That's where you'll be able to find rules and policies. For on-field assistance, visit our Coaching Education Resource Center for helpful articles and videos and documents. You also have technical staff members at your disposal to answer questions for you or to provide you advice or guidance. We as coaches play an important role in the lives of these young athletes. We can make or break their experience so it's important that we keep a healthy perspective. Recognize that your value as a coach is not measured by wins or losses. It's really measured by the enjoyment and the development of these players as individuals and as athletes. Make it fun for the kids so they want to keep coming back. And please set a positive example so others on the field, other coaches, parents, spectators, can follow your lead. Thanks for coaching with us and good luck this season.